Thanks for waiting, everybody. We'll be starting very shortly. Right, I think we are ready to start. So a warm welcome to everybody. Welcome to our digital info day. So this, in this event, we're going to talk about what to expect and how to prepare for a stem cell transplant. We are going to be discussing who this treatment is suitable for and the transplant process, as well as how to handle your recovery. Uh, just so you know, the event is being recorded and it's going to be available to watch on our Facebook page and on the website soon after. Uh, the event is going to be a mixture of presentations and some time for questions. So um, big thanks to those of you that have already submitted some questions. If you want to put some questions in during the event, please use the Q&A box. And if you'd like to speak with each other, you can use the chat option. We will be putting some useful links in the chat box throughout the event. Um, and both the chat box and the Q&A box can be found at the bottom of your screen. So if you have a question and perhaps you'd rather not ask it this evening or you think of something after the webinar is finished, which is often the way, you can always talk to your haematology team or you can get in touch with us at Myeloma UK on the Myeloma info line or by using the Ask the Nurse email. So, um, just to introduce myself, I'm Monica. Um, I work at Myeloma UK and I work on the healthcare professional programs um, for the charity. I am a haematology nurse um, by background and have been a myeloma clinical nurse specialist for several years as well um, and looked after a lot of people going through stem cell transplant. Um, in terms of Myeloma UK, some of you may not be familiar with us. So just to tell you briefly who we are and what we do, um, Myeloma UK exists to support all of those affected by myeloma and its related conditions. These include smoldering myeloma, MGUS and AL amyloidosis. We're a patient focused organization. Uh, we aim to empower, inform and support patients in everything that we do. As an organization, we do rely on the generosity and kindness of supporters fundraising, fundraising and donating um, to us. We receive no core government funding, so your support is vital and we're truly thankful for all the contributions um, we receive as they allow us to continue working to help patients, their family and friends. So, to carry on with the evening, I'd like to welcome our um, expert this evening, Professor Guy Pratt. Um, Professor Pratt is a consultant haematologist and honorary professor of haematology at Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham, uh, University's NHS Foundation Trust for the full, <laughs> the full title of the hospital. Um, but just before I hand over to Guy um, to start the session, um, we'd like to share a short video with you um, from Louise, who's recently undergone a stem cell transplant. Now, Louise has made several videos of her stem cell transplant journey. Um, we've only got time to play a short amount of her really wonderful content, but you can go to our YouTube channel for more. Um, and I believe the link is going to go up in the chat now. In this video clip, Louise is going to be giving us a tour of her hospital room as she prepares for the process. Ward. So I'm in, I'm unpacked and um, had a good night's sleep and I'm waiting to start treatment today with the Melphaland chemo. So I'm starting on my ice lollies at about 10 o'clock. Um, and the chemo will start at 10.30. Um, the ice is to for me to have during while the chemo is administered because it can um, really dry out your mouth and cause lots of mouth and throat infections. It's got a name and I can't remember how to say it. So, um, but they reckon by, by sucking on the ice, it really helps. So sorry, someone just asked me if I wanted a hot drink. Um, right, so what I thought I'd do is give everyone a little tour 
of, of the room just very quickly. Um, so I'm going to turn you around. And I know there's a lot of people in a, a Myeloma Facebook group that I'm part of that uh, uh, haven't been in for stem cells and are quite curious as to what the room looks like. So um, I'm going to turn you around. I'm going to start at the door and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll see how, um, with how it goes and I'll try and be quick. Right. So I'm standing at the door. It's all it's all very basic, but it's it's all very clean. Um, you have your own fridge, and of course, every hospital is going to be is going to be different. Um, got a few little supplies in there for myself, um, but I do believe that all rooms as standard have a fridge. Um, so. I had a lot of luggage. Um, there's quite a bit of storage. You know, you can keep your food in there, which is great. A chair that reclines so you can sit and watch your Netflix. Um, bed. I bought in my own duvet because I just find it more comfortable and more homely, especially if I'm going to be in here a few weeks. Um, I also bought my hot water bottle. Good tip. Hospitals are always freezing, in my opinion. So, um, I'll be filling that up and having that while they uh, they give me the ice pops anyway. Um, and then just sort of further storage on here where you can put your bits and pretty small wardrobe. Um, but, you know, nonetheless, there's a wardrobe. Um, I have got the best view. I'm so lucky. I have been given the view of um, all the cars coming into the car park. So that's really pretty. I'm really happy about that. Um, I'll just take you. Obviously, each room has its own bathroom. Again, you know, it's all very, it's all very clean um, and and very very functional. Um, but it works. It works, and you can get your stuff out and. Oh, yeah, this, this is probably going to be my home for the next two to four weeks, as I said, depending on how quickly those stem cells do their job and, and I recover and, and I can go home. So there you go. Um, fingers crossed, should be starting soon and I will catch up with you all as soon as I can. Take care. Bye. So we will be watching another short video from Louise at the end of the presentation. Um, I thought that was fantastic to see her room and I thought the hot water bottle um, and own duvet were super tips really for, um, for her stay. But so now I'd like to hand over to Guy um, who's going to be starting his presentation. Thank you, Guy. Thank you, Monica. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, this evening about uh, transplant in terms of the process. So uh, collecting your stem cells and then the process of the transplant itself. And I'll talk about the, the, the bad, the side effects and the good, the benefit of, of a transplant. Um, we'll then talk about recovery and what that looks like. And I'll also mention about uh, maintenance treatment as well. Next slide. I think one important message is that it, it is a serious pr procedure. Uh, it's a more intensive treatment option. And uh, it does take uh, many weeks or, or months to recover from. I think one important point is that recovery is very much an individual thing and it does vary tremendously between one individual and another individual. And it's hard to know uh, how you, you will personally tolerate the, the transplant uh, from, from, the beginning, from the beginning. It's important to realise that actually only about a third of myeloma patients have a transplant. Uh, and that's because uh, it's too strong a procedure. It's too uh, toxic a procedure for... Um, less fit uh, uh, patients uh, and that's something to bear in mind so it's usually the fit patients um noticed i've avoided using the word age but actually obviously that is something we, we look at as long as with everything else but i'm very aware that you can be 75 and, and cycling and uh, be very active and fit 
uh, and you can be 65 and very unfit. So age is not uh, certainly not the, the only thing that we look at. It's not a curative procedure. It doesn't uh, get rid of the myeloma for good, um, but it is a standard, uh, gold standard treatment option for younger, fitter patients. And it usually does provide a, a good response in the majority of cases, but, but not every patient. Next slide, please. It's a planned procedure, and I think this is very important. You do have a lot of time um, because you have uh, many months of uh, treatment, the induction treatment, before you have the transplant. Uh, and during that time, you'll be able, hopefully, to have discussions uh, with your consultant, clinical nurse specialist, uh, the apheresis nurses, and also, of course, your family and uh, friends as well. Um, so we're not going to force you to make a decision uh, fairly quickly. You've got a lot of time there uh, because it's a planned procedure. We do do um, heart tests or lung tests or, or renal function in some patients. Um, as it's a planned procedure, you're usually given dates for uh, collecting your stem cells and a rough date for when the admission might be, but obviously. Uh, particularly in the last two years with COVID, um, that has messed things up a bit. And there have been delays in, in patients waiting to have uh, transplants, uh, particularly uh, recently. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to talk through the process, uh, the induction treatment, which is usually uh, four to six months of treatment, the stem cell harvest, so harvesting stem cells is a distinct uh, process, um, which is a se separate process. And, and once we've got the stem cells, um, you can put them in the, in the, in the fridge. And then uh, coming in for the transplant itself, which is the, the big bit. As Louise said, it's been in hospital for two or three weeks, uh, possibly longer and having a, a big dose of chemotherapy in the form of melphalan and uh, the recovery from that, which I'll go through. Next slide. One of the important points is that we, we don't do the transplants at the beginning. Uh, we only do transplants in general in hematology, and this applies to leukemia as well. Uh, after a period of treatment to reduce the amount of disease in the bone marrow to a low level. We call that the induction treatment. Following induction treatment, uh, there's usually a bit of a break before we collect the stem cells, and that's a, a day unit procedure, so you're not actually an in, inpatient for that. And I'll talk about that. And then the high dose therapy, the big dose of melphalan, uh, which kills the myeloma cells, but also affects other organs, which I will talk about. And then the process of the actual recovery from that as your stem cells start to uh, produce new bone marrow and new white cells, red cells, and platelets. Next slide. So the induction treatment is typically four to six months. Uh, and then there's a bit of a break. Um, it may be six weeks, it may be eight weeks. It, it depends on uh, waiting lists, uh, for example. And then the stem cell mobilization procedure, um, which uh, I'll talk about, but that's done as a, an outpatient. You won't need to be in hospital for that typically, but it does involve uh, visits to the day unit, and I'll talk about that. And then I'm sure it'll come up in the Q&A, uh, but there's a break then. So once we've got your stem cells, they go in the freezer and they can stay there indefinitely. Uh, particularly during the last two years, that the break between collecting the stem cells and then coming in for the transplant has become a bit of an issue with waiting times. Having said that, uh, in Birmingham, it has got a lot better recently. But that break is uh, variable. Uh, and it depends a bit on the, on the waiting list and the situation in terms of 
uh, availability of beds. You're usually in hospital for about two to three weeks on average, and then you go home and there is a recovery period. Unfortunately, you don't go home uh, feeling on, on top of the world. You'll still be, as I'll talk about, still be having some side effects as well, such as particularly fatigue uh, and anorexia, which I'll talk about. And that's variable. As I said already, I think it's really important to emphasize that um, it's very much an individual uh, journey. And there's a lot of variation. If you talk to patients who've had a stem cell transplant, one patient may have found it uh, not a problem at all, where others um, have, have struggled with it. And none of us, unfortunately, including um, so-called experts like myself and Monica, can predict that very easily. Next slide, please. So induction treatment um, in the UK uh, at the moment is uh, Velcade, uh, dexamethasone, uh, thalidomide, and, and recently um, NICE approved the addition of uh, daratumumab, which is a monoclonal antibody to that. And you can uh, use cyclophosphamide rather than thalidomide. Uh, and these are fairly standard approaches. So I think uh, I'm pretty confident that everywhere around the UK will have a very similar approach. Um, you can occasionally use lenalidomide dexamethasone in particular patients who want that option. But the vast majority of patients are getting uh, Velcade as a, usually a weekly injection. Uh, dexamethasone two days a week, uh, and then either continuous thalidomide or, or weekly cyclophosphamide. And then uh, more recently, uh, daratumumab as a monoclonal antibody. Occasionally, we do use more intensive treatment. Uh, that's usually in patients where we feel that we want to improve the response uh, to the, um, the bortezomib uh, dexamethasone. Uh, thalidomide combination, for example. So it's, it's not often we do that, but we do sometimes have to do that because we feel that we need to get the myeloma to a low level uh, before the transplant. Uh, next slide, please. So um, mobilizing and, and storing stem cells, it sounds complicated, but actually that's uh, relatively straightforward and, and relatively um, free of side effects. I will uh, discuss uh, about the process uh, in a minute in the next slides. Uh, and then for the transplant itself, you're in hospital for two to three weeks, and then there is a re recovery phase, which I will go through. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm showing my age a bit um, when I say that uh, when I started off in hematology, uh, the only way we could get stem cells was to do a, a, what we call a bone marrow harvest and suck them out of the bone marrow. So you know the bone marrow biopsy that you have, uh, we would actually spend um, an hour in theatre uh, taking out bone marrow. I'm gl glad to say that in the 1990s that was rapidly uh, replaced um, because we uh, were able to use um, a drug called GCSF, which is an injection under the skin, which stimulated stem cells to come out into the blood. And, and if you give this once a day for five days, stem cells will come out of the bone marrow and uh, circulate into the blood, and then we can collect them. This is the commonest mobilization regimen. It's just a, a daily injection of, of uh, GCSF, which is called granulocyte colony stimulating factor. It's actually uh, a hormone that's present in all of us, but if you give it in big, big doses, uh, it has this effect. Occasionally, uh, some units use uh, cyclophosphamide uh, before the GCSF to try and boost the stem cells coming out into the blood. Um, in addition, um, we can add another drug called Plerixifor, which is an injection, um, if we feel that the stem cells uh, are insufficient in the peripheral blood. And we do this 
just prior to the stem cell, uh, the day before we uh, count the number of stem cells, and if it's insufficient, we may give an injection of Plurix 4. None of this is particularly new. As I said, it's been going on since the 1990s. Just to emphasize that uh, GCSF can cause some side effects. It can make you achy. Um, it can cause bone pain. Um, it can cause flu-like symptoms as well. So some people do feel a bit rough on it and some people don't like it at all. Uh, so just to be aware of that. Um, however, the majority of people are fine with it. Next slide, please. So in Birmingham, we've got a very large apheresis unit, which uh, most all transplant centers will have. And you sit in a, in a comfort chair and are plugged into a machine called an apheresis machine. So you have um, blood coming out of one arm, goes around the apheresis machine, uh, which takes off the stem cells. And all the other bits of the blood are circulated back into you, into the patient. I always think of an apheresis machine a bit like a washing machine. That's what it is. It's a centrifuge, so it separates out cells and you're able to collect whatever cells you want. In this case, it's stem cells. And uh, they end up in, in, a, in a bag and they do appear quite yellow. So that's that bag, as you can see on this diagram, there may be a bit of red cells in it, so it may be red. Um, and it usually takes about three hours, three or four hours on one day. And often people have to come back the next day for another um, session or even three days. So this is done as an outpatient. The stem cells are taken away by the National Blood Service and put in uh, liquid nitrogen in the freezer. And they can stay there for years indefinitely. We've always aimed to collect enough stem cells for two procedures, which I'll talk about. Um, and obviously we'll measure the amount of stem cells that are being collected. So uh, your consultant will know the number of stem cells that you've got um, if you want to ask them. Importantly, you can have your stem cells stored and some patients don't go ahead with a transplant for whatever reason. So you need to think of this as a separate procedure. You can put them in the uh, liquid nitrogen and they stay there. And that might be quite, good, quite a good idea for some patients, particularly if you're not keen on doing a transplant for whatever reason or you're a bit unsure, but you're a young, fit patient, then maybe that's a good idea to do if you change your mind, for example. Stem cells can live in the freezer for a very long time, but if they're in there for a long time, then we do have to check that they are viable uh, when they come out. If we're going to use them, say, five or 10 years later, they normally are, but we do have to check that. Next slide, please. please. So we've had real problems during COVID. I think this will hopefully uh, cease uh, now uh, for the moment. I don't know, of course, there may be further waves of COVID, so no one knows what the future will bring. But this, this idea of a break or bridging treatment is a bit new to me, to be honest. Um, in the past, we collected stem cells and then usually um, the waiting list wasn't too bad and we could get patients in. However, if the waiting list is a lot of time, say three months or six months, um, then uh, we do feel that there, might, there may be some argument for using a anti-myeloma treatment. Uh, this could be lenalidomide as a, as a single oral tablet, or it could be further cycles of whatever initial chemotherapy you have. And that's to try and prevent the myeloma coming back uh, and avoiding a long period of time when you're not on any treatment. So it's trying to prevent that from happening um, because it can happen to some patients. It, it, it's unfortunately, it's not something you could ever predict. That's the problem with it. 
And so the idea of bridging is to try and prevent that and get you to your transplant. Next slide, please. So as Louise uh, illustrated, it's an elective procedure. You do need a central line. It's usually in the form of a pick line, which is uh, shown here in the nice diagram here of a pick line. It looks like a, a, a vent flon, but actually it's a long line. So it's, um, it goes right up into the veins in your uh, neck area. And the point of it is it allows uh, to infuse uh, antibiotics or chemotherapy or whatever is needed. Um, and it's very safe to do that. So, I mean, importantly, it can be used to take blood. Uh, having said that, occasionally it can be uh, difficult to get blood out of these. I think that's important to, to mention that. Uh, but for the majority of patients, it works wonderfully. So it avoids any uh, daily needle punctures for you. That obviously has to happen uh, before you come in or immediately when you come in. And then you're given uh, a big dose of malphalan. And I think what, what's important here is um, to know that actually uh, we can either give what we call a full dose, like 200 milligrams per meter squared, it's done on your body surface area, or 140. So uh, we do decide to give a slightly lower dose to some patients. So patients, for example, who are, who are more frail or have uh, comorbidities, we will give a lower dose. And also patients with renal impairment, for example, we definitely give a lower dose. The PIC line stays in throughout the procedure. It's very easy to take out. Um, you just pull it out at the end. Um, it can get infected, so they, they're not uh, free of problems. They can get infected, they can get blocked. And occasionally you can get a thrombosis because um, you can get a clot related to it. So there are complications with them uh, and they do need to be removed if they're troublesome, which can happen. The melphalan is, uh, is usually very one day, it's very quick, there's lots of fluids uh, with it, um, and it destroys the, the bone marrow cells and the myeloma cells at the same time. Um, we've been doing this probably since the early 90s. Actually, it was um, Royal Marsden back in the 80s that came up with this procedure. So it's, it's been around an awfully long time. Next slide, please. So stem cells um, are thawed out um, in a, uh, rapidly. In a, in a, so they come along in a, in a, um, from the blood transfusion service usually, and they're thawed out uh, rapidly. Uh, and uh, they're in a preservative called DMSO, which smells a bit. Um, I won't say what it smells like. I think this platys description is probably sweet corn. Um, but it, that smell does go away. You don't notice it, actually, after a, a, a time. Um, the stem cells magically circulate around your blood and then home to the bone marrow because that's where they live and they've got uh, receptors on their surface that make them home to the bone marrow. But they take um, two or three weeks to start growing and producing new uh, red blood cells or white blood cells or platelets. And interestingly, the ones we're most bothered about as doctors are the neutrophils because they're the ones that fight infections and the ones which, um, when they're up, will make us think about sending you home as long as you're well. Um, but until that point, so for two or three weeks, you will have uh, virtually zero neutrophils. You will have a very low platelet count, probably uh, maybe even single figures. And you probably will need a blood transfusion um, during that time. Uh, next slide, please. I think this is 
to, to my mind, obviously I'm, I'm not a patient, but I think this is probably one of the most important slides this evening. This is what happens. Fatigue is it's not, uh, it's not normal fatigue, it's, it's excessive fatigue, and that is quite prolonged. Um, as I've said to you, it's very individual, but that will last uh, when you go home. So it may last weeks or even months. The other organ that's particularly targeted by Malphalan is your gut. So feeling sick, uh, losing your appetite or changing appetite is almost um, happens to every patient. So things won't taste the same. Um, you may develop a sore mouth and it can affect the, the whole of the gut. So you can get indigestion, get diarrhea or constipation. Um, but the thing you're most likely to have is when you go home is that um, poor appetite. That, that again will gradually come back over time. Chemo brain. So I think this word came to me from my Loma UK years ago and I've hung on to it. I think it's a great term. That lack of concentration, that ability to uh, focus on things. And um, that's really quite common with uh, treatment for myeloma, but particularly a stem cell transplant. At the bottom of this list is something which actually is, is really important because infection is, uh, is probably the most important thing from a medical point of view. So in terms of the seriousness of it, uh, and that's why you need to be uh, in hospital, or if you're having an ambulatory transplant, you need to be very near a hospital so you can get those antibiotics uh, within, uh, within an hour. Um, because your immune system is so low, um, the infection is usually within that time frame of the first two to three weeks, but it is possible to get an infection later on uh, after you go home, but that's much less likely. The majority of patients having a transplant will have a fever um, and they will start antibiotics. Uh, but importantly, you don't always find a source for that infection. And that's quite common in hematology. Okay, next slide, please. There are risks with the procedure. So the risks of dying of the procedure about 3%, so three in 100 patients, which um, is actually, I think, quite low as a doctor, but obviously everyone views risk differently. The patients most likely to die of the procedure are probably the less fit, older, frailer patients. Um, and that's why we're, we're very robust about discussing and talking about the risks of transplant with patients and making sure you understand that. However, the risk of side effects is high. So things like the fatigue and the um, nausea and the anorexia are likely, but they are short-lived. Uh, and as I've said, uh, everyone is different. So I think it's important if you are going to speak to people that you speak to more than one person because you will get uh, different uh, experiences from different people as well. Next slide, please. Interestingly, uh, myeloma doctors do trials to try and get rid of transplants because uh, they prefer it if they wouldn't have to do a transplant. But it's quite clear, even in 2022, that the benefit of the transplant is definitely uh, still here with us. So we haven't been able to, in other words, we haven't had an alternative treatment that's going to give you a better outcome in terms of your myeloma. And it's the best option for fitter, younger patients. There's one important caveat, and that's it doesn't work for every patient. So it's possible to have a transplant for the myeloma still to come back fairly quickly. And I think that's 
something which sadly we can't predict that um, before the transplant. So the benefit is that it significantly increases the time for the myeloma to come back. And we now have a maintenance treatment with lenalidomide, which is a tablet maintenance therapy. And that period could be many years. And that clearly is an advantage to not doing a transplant where it would be a bit, it'd be shorter than that. And during that time, after your recovery, most people are generally very well, uh, often can go back to work and have a really good quality of life. The studies looking at survival, there probably is a survival benefit, uh, but it's quite hard to work that out, particularly um, given that there are like so many different treatments in myeloma these days. So it still is a what we call a gold standard option for patients if they're young and fit enough for it uh, in 2022. I think that concludes my first part of the um, of the slides. Thank you very much, Guy, for taking us uh, through that. A lot of interesting information. Um, sure, it's really helpful for people watching, you know, whether somebody, you know, you're about to go through a transplant yourself or you're um, just been diagnosed and thinking this might be something that is offered to you or you're supporting somebody going through transplant. So um, we're running a little bit behind, but we're going to fit in as many questions as we can. Um, so um, first question um, is from Claire. Uh, Claire wants to know about visiting. So can you visit myeloma patients during their stem cell transplant or are there strict rules for hospitals just now because of COVID? And added to that, what is the advice for visiting patients at home during the recovery? Unfortunately, uh, fairly strict about COVID now at the moment. So we don't have any visitors um, at all, um, except obviously in extreme situations, which doesn't apply here to, to us. So uh, unfortunately, there's a blanket policy and, uh, and I, we can't overrule that, uh, unfortunately. I think in the recovery phase, um, uh, I do think it's important to realise there's no laws written down in tablets of stone anywhere. So um, you just have to be very sensible. You know, you are at risk. You are uh, your immune system is extremely low, and uh, you don't want to be exposed to um, to, to bugs uh, in particular. So. Um, I don't think I'm going to be dogmatic and say you can't do this or you can't do that. You just have to uh, think about things like, uh, you know, avoiding crowds, obviously, probably staying at home. Um, I personally, I wouldn't feel that you should not see uh, people that you, you love and are close to you. Um, obviously, they ought to be having lateral flow tests um, as, as well, and they, they need to be well and free of infection. Um, so I think it's important to realize that there are, it's not written down anywhere, what you can and cannot do. It's, it's, it's a lot of, a lot of it's about common sense. A lot of it's about your perception of risk as well, because um, you know, some people have, uh, don't, don't want to get any exposure to any bugs and they'll be uh, uh, willing to, to, to isolate completely, whereas other people um, will want to see people. And I, I don't think we can be strict about that. Great, thanks, Guy. I think, yeah, I think we've all probably got um, a lot, are a lot more conscious about, you know, how to sort of stay safe because of COVID as well and got quite used to avoiding people when they maybe have symptoms of a cold or anything like that. So um, our next question is from Linford. Um, Linford ask, asks, I've had stem cells collected and I'm just waiting for a date. Is there anything I can do to extend my remission time? Um, 
yeah so this this is around bridging therapy um, mm. and uh, it's become an issue with with waiting less times you know if, if it's excessive if, if it's beyond two or three months then I think you do need to have a discussion with your consultant about um, hopefully your consultant will bring it up about whether you should be on lenalidomide for example um, to control your myeloma so sort of reducing the risk of it coming back while you're waiting to come in for your transplant. Uh, I'm hoping all this will go away in the next few months, but uh, clearly it hasn't done at the moment. So that's the conversation you need to be having. I guess we're still trying to catch up a little bit from COVID. So, yeah, thank yeah. you Guy, for that. Um, next question is about second stem cell transplant from Christopher. Christopher asks, if I have a second stem cell transplant, will my unused stem cells that were harvested the first time round be used? Yes, that's right. So uh, we always try and collect uh, enough for two transplants. Uh, we don't always manage that, but we will aim for that. Um, so you will have, most patients will have residual stem cells left over that are stored. Um, second transplants, uh, probably uh, less than five to 10% of myeloma patients have a second transplant. So it's, it's not common we do that actually, um, but we do think about it in patients who've had a very, very good response to the first transplant, say uh, well over four or five years or longer than we will think about it. Okay, yeah, and I guess as, as uh... From the early days when stem cell transplants first came in, we've got a lot more treatment alternatives now as well. But our next question actually is slightly related to that um, from Vanessa. Uh, Vanessa had a stem cell transplant in 2017, but has recently relapsed. Uh, she had a baby in June 2021 and couldn't start her chemo. So she's worried about being away from her children and wondered what the alternative to a second stem cell transplant might be in terms of treatment? Yeah, so um, when I said a, a stem cell transplant is a gold standard treatment, that's the first transplant. I think the second transplant is much more woolly. And uh, there may, if it's worked really well the first time, then we will probably uh, think about it the second time. But the evidence for it is, is much less clear. And, and the reason for that is that we're having new treatment advances all the time in myeloma. So um, new drugs, new therapies. Uh, and it's questionable, really, how good a second transplant is. Uh, and that's why we only do maybe one in 20, uh, one in 10 patients who've had a first transplant actually get a second transplant because of that. Uh, so there's, I wouldn't be much more, um, you know, geared towards a conversation about whether you, you really should be having a second transplant or not. I don't feel as strongly about that. And I've had patients who've had one transplant who don't want another transplant. Uh, and I feel very strongly you should, you should be supported if that's your view, because it's much less clear cut for you, given there's so many different options now uh, later on in myeloma treatment. Uh, after the first uh, remission. Great, thank you. So yeah, sounds like Vanessa will be able to have a conversation with her team about what options are available to her. Uh, next question is from Sophie, uh, who asks, do you strictly have to isolate after a stem cell transplant or does it depend on your blood results and how you're recovering? Um. Again, I, don't, I, I think you need, you need to be avoiding obvious infection areas. So, uh, but I wouldn't feel strongly about you know whether you have loved ones coming, close family. Um, you, you probably need that when you go home. Um, but, but clearly, at the moment, you know, with the COVID situation, uh, I wouldn't be recommending you going out beyond that. Um, and obviously, there need to be doing all the right things, lateral flow tests, making sure they're well. And hygiene is really important, hand hygiene, things like that, uh, for, for, for visitors as well as yourself. 
Thanks. Thank you. Um, again, sort of slightly connected to this, uh, another question is asking, can you explain a little bit more about ambulatory care and what would make patients eligible for this? Yes, so a lot of transplant centres do ambulatory transplants and uh, you have to tick quite a few boxes to have an ambulatory transplant. So you have to be younger, fitter, um, there may be an age cut off, uh, maybe 70. Um, you need to live near the hospital, so you can't be too far away. And they may stipulate either a mileage or a time. Um, you, you need to be with a carer. So you need to have someone who's going to be with you 24 hours. Um, and you need to be, have rapid access to, to the hospital. Um, and you need to be willing to come to the day unit every day to have checks possibly uh, and to be admitted at the drop of a hat uh, should you get uh, a temperature for example so there's quite a few um, tick, tick boxes that you, you need to tick to have an ambulatory transplant but it's well worth uh, discussing that uh, with your consultant because um, it's it's a nicer way in a way to have a transplant if you can actually be uh, at home with a with a carer uh, um, so I remember in the old days we had um, somewhere else where I work we had a we had a house that people lived in which was so much you know which was a nicer environment really so the the ambulatory transplant is something that's worth discussing with your consultant you may not be eligible for it uh, but it's worth thinking about thank you and yeah it might be something that is offered slightly differently depending on where you're being treated um, in according to what's available. So um, just we've got one more question at the moment. Um, can you tell us, Guy, what is the average recovery time after a stem cell transplant? So after sort of going home? Yes, yeah, so it's two or three weeks in the hospital and then it's weeks or months of recovery. And that's hugely variable. Sorry, I can't give an answer. Um, it could be a few weeks or it could be longer than that and occasionally it's shorter you know occasionally people um, recover very quickly after a transplant so it's a huge variability yeah. and it may be one thing in particular that's that, that holds you back it may be the fatigue or it may be the appetite side of things um, it varies yeah it's always difficult isn't it I've paid, you know it's, people so want to know how long it's going to be for them and it really is difficult to, to always always say um, everyone is an individual but um, it helps to be sort of prepared prepared for that so right well um, we're now going to um, move on to the next part of the presentation from Guy um, we are running a little late so we might need to do um, a bit of a whiz through the next section so we don't overrun um, too much. Um, so back over to you, Guy, to pick up. Okay, this is actually the probably the, the less scientific bit of the, the talk, so I'll, I will go fairly quickly through it. Uh, you're, you're in hospital for two or three weeks, and you go home generally when you're well and your neutral count has started to recover, but your blood count may not be completely normal. Um, and it's really fatigue and loss of appetite, um, or changed appetite, that's the big things. And it may be things like your bowels may not be right either. So diarrhea and this uh, chemo brain. Uh, next slide, please. It's important um, at any point with myeloma to, to maintain personal hygiene. A lot of the bugs that people get are actually on their own skin. Um, so hand washing, um, making sure that you've got a clean towel, uh, oral hygiene, uh, obviously regular dental checkups before is something that we all do. 
And then, of course, being aware of signs of infection, such as a fever or a cough, for example. Uh, next slide. So um, this is self-explanatory, really, avoiding foods that have, uh, are likely to have uh, lots of bugs in them. So um, making sure you wash foods and cook them properly, a meticulous uh, kitchen hygiene, um, hand washing, and uh, making sure you're getting food from a reputable source. Uh, next slide. Uh, no issues really with pets, apart from, again, hygiene-related issues um, and uh, making sure that you, you're not going to get any bugs from them. So uh, washing hands and avoiding uh, uh, litter trays, for example. Next slide. Uh, the fatigue will get better. Um, it just takes time, and that time's very variable. And it's important to try and remain a bit active. Uh, I think one of the things that we underestimate is actually immobility is not a good thing, uh, but you need to balance that with rest. Um, and gentle exercise may help. And there's a good uh, booklet from My Loma UK that you can look at. Next slide, please. Work. Um, Working from, from homes obviously become um, very common with COVID, um, but it obviously depends on your work. You need to uh, manage work load properly. So it's phased return or limited amounts of work. Uh, understanding, understanding employees are really important and make sure they're aware of what you've been through and what, what's going on. Next slide, please. So we now have lenalidomide maintenance. It was approved um, about a year ago, um, and that's started around 100 days after the transplant, so around three months. And it's a simple oral tablet on its own every day for three weeks and a week off, and then you start again. And it's given indefinitely, so you're on it hopefully for many years, and it keeps the myeloma under control. And it's really good evidence very strong evidence from about four trials now that it adds a lot of time on to when the myeloma starts to become active again. Next slide, please. So we recommend uh, vaccination. So the transplant will wipe out your vaccination history. So all those vaccines you had as a child, all those uh, antibodies that you developed will be wiped out. So we have to completely revaccinate you uh, against COVID three months. And then around six to 12 months, it does vary depending on the transplant center, uh, all those childhood vaccinations. And we will provide a schedule for your GP. Your GP normally does that. Next slide, please. I've already spoken, a, 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 a tiny minority of patients have a second transplant usually for people who've had a very good response uh, to the first transplant. Uh, another group that may have a tra second transplant are those patients who got uh, bad genetics. Um, and that's done uh, three months after the first transplant, where it's felt that two transplants may be beneficial in this setting. Again, that's slightly controversial, um, but many of us think that that's quite a reasonable thing to do. The evidence around second transplants is much more difficult, much less evidence for it, um, because there's so many good treatments in myeloma now, it's become a bit unclear what the role of second transplants is. Next slide, please. Allogeneic stem cell transplantation is using a, a donor who's uh, another human being. So it could be a brother or sister, or someone who's completely unrelated to you, um, who's on one of the registries, the bone marrow registries, and it uses uh, their stem cells. We don't use it very commonly in myeloma, and the reason is it's much riskier in myeloma, um, and it's quite controversial, to be honest, um, in the sense that you will get different opinions from different myeloma doctors, which is not always helpful. Um, 
There is some benefit to it, though. There's no doubt that uh, some patients do benefit from an allogeneic transplant. Um, the difficulty we have is uh, not knowing which of those patients are. So it's a much riskier procedure. There's much more side effects with it um, than there is with a, a autologous transplant, which is the standard transplant you get with uh, myeloma. And you have to be quite young and fit to have this. Next slide, please. So I've, I've gone through really the, the process uh, and uh, the transplant itself and the good, good and the bad of the transplant uh, and what recovery looks like and spoken a bit about maintenance therapy. Uh, thank you. I think we come to the next Q&A session. Yeah, because we're running sort of slightly near to our time, so um, we, we've actually sort of combined our Q&As, and um, so if I can ask you just to go through the take-home messages, we will, um, we've got a few more minutes left of the webinar, so um, please stay with us if you can. If you, if you have to go, then um, remember the uh, recording will be on Facebook and it will be on the website later, but hopefully you'll be able to stay with us just for a few more minutes um, while we finish off. So um, Guy, if you could just go through our take home messages for today, please. Yeah, so, so high dose therapy and, and transplant uh, involves several stages. It's a planned procedure, which you can discuss. Um, you have lots of time to discuss it. Uh, it's a riskier treatment option and should be carefully considered. Um, unfortunately, the treatment and recovery process does take uh, weeks or months and is very variable, uh, but it remains a, a standard treatment uh, around the world at the moment. Thank you. Lovely, thanks. If I could just quickly ask one thing actually, that because it was on our questions about the vaccinations. Um, does that, is that arranged by the hospital or is that arranged by the GP? Usually it's us uh, asking the GP to do it. I think that's most what most transplant centres do. Yeah. And so I will write to the GP saying, can you do these vaccinations? And they, they are usually very good at that. Yeah. So they will do it. OK, so the instruction sort of comes from the haematology team. Lovely. Thank you for that, Guy. Um, so now I'd like to show just another video from Louise, who we heard from at the beginning of the webinar. Um, and this video is, was recorded during her recovery. I think for a few weeks after, you know, your transplant is a little bit of a, a watch and wait and see what your bloods do. They, they do tend to go sort of up and down. Um, but anyway. The good news is I caught up with everyone else and the bloods picked up and all got between normal range and I've been home a week and I feel much better than I did when when I got home. I think the main issues um, for me were um, just just weakness and um, my haemoglobin was really low so I was very very anemic so I was very very dizzy um, and sort of found it quite hard to to do very much um and I live alone so that was a little bit challenging so my, my mum came over every day and and more or less helped me and, and looked after me and I did need that to be honest so anyone going through or thinking of going through it you know you do you do need a little bit of help when you when you come out um so to summarize um I would probably say that the process of having the Milfalan chemo and getting your stem cells back is a little bit of an anticlimax. Um, the waiting game for your neutrophils to hit zero is just really, really kind of bizarre. And then the minute they hit zero, all you want them to do is pick back up um, so that you can feel better. And, you know, that eventually happens. And you know, there may be various symptoms in between. As I said, I was quite lucky, mine were quite mild. And the minute that your bloods recover, so do all of those symptoms. So it it's probably wasn't as bad as I was thinking that it would be. 
Um, but equally, I think post sort of transplant, post coming home was maybe a little bit more difficult than I thought that that was going to be in terms of um, weakness, uh, fatigue and looking after yourself. So um, those would be my kind of top top tips and from my experience of what I found. Um, so yeah, I hope that that's updated you. I hope it's informed you a little bit. Um, and any questions, let me know and um, hopefully speak to you soon. Um, that's just fantastic to watch these um, video clips from Louise and see somebody who's you know recently gone through the process. So hopefully that's encouraging for all of you to see somebody um, talking about their experience. And as I said before, you can find Louise's videos on the YouTube uh, YouTube channel. So just to uh, show you some of the resources that are relevant for this webinar, which might be useful. So we've got an info guide on um, stem cell transplantation um, covers, you know, in detail the information that Guy has taken you through today. So you can have a look at that. There's also a, um, a booklet which was is full of tips from patients, the small things that make all the difference. So these are all these tips like the hot water bottle and the duvet, um, you know, just, just the sort of things that we as doctors and nurses, you know, probably don't think to mention, but what patients know. Um, so do have a look at that. And also we've got a guide on lenalidomide maintenance, which is now being used. Uh, so we also have a number of other resources to help you. Uh, we've got our myeloma info line and our nurse email. Uh, our myeloma information specialists are available Monday to Friday, nine till five. Uh, as well as the info packs and info, um, info sheets that we've mentioned so far in the chat box, we've got a huge range of publications that you can download from the website. And you can also order them um, and we can put them, put them in a the post to you. We also, um, also to let you know that our, these digital info day sessions um, are all on our website and YouTube channel. So you can watch them on demand. And we've also got a discussion forum on the website where you can join conversations with other patients, family members and friends. Because I think um, that is really important, I think talking to somebody who's been through this procedure or is probably about to go for it as well, um, I think hope is really supportive when you're um, looking ahead. Um, it, in the same vein, really, um, we've got a range of support groups all over the UK um, uh, to meet other patients who might be going through this process and indeed any of the other um, treatments um, of myeloma and living with myeloma. Um, and you can find details of the groups on our website. So um, we've come to the end of our um, webinar today. I'm sorry uh, we've gone over um, a little bit, um, but first of all, I'd like to say a very big thank you to um, Professor Guy Pratt um, for speaking and answering questions. And also a very big thank you to everyone who's joined us um, for this event tonight. Uh, we hope that you found it helpful and informative. Um, I'm sorry if we didn't manage to answer all the questions that came in, um, or if this has brought up new questions, please do get in touch with us um, via the info line or our SNS. Um, details of that are on the screen now, and you can rewatch the webinar, as I've said before, and it will soon be up on our website. Um, Thank you again to all our supporters. Um, so it's thanks to you that Myeloma UK um, can put on um, free digital events like this one for patients and families. So if you'd like to support the work of Myeloma UK, please uh, visit um, us on the web, web link there, myeloma.org.uk um, forward slash donate. Thank you. And do keep an eye on the website and social media channels for announcements of further digital info day sessions. We do have them regularly. Um, and 
that just leaves me really to um, thank you all again um, for joining us tonight. Um, we're, we hope it's been helpful for you and uh, hope that you enjoy the rest of your evening and we'll see you again soon. Thanks everybody. Good night. <laughs>